because it's still quite static. So we are still here with the large herd of buffaloes that seemed to be moving into Buffalzook but look like they're moving back into Juma, which is quite cool. I thought they were leaving us, but now they're actually coming back. You can actually see them grazing just ahead of us here, right by the road. So this is our cut line to Buffalzook. If you look in the distance there, the buffaloes on the dam wall of what seems to be, this seems to be a dam wall there. But a whole bunch of buffaloes are walking up there. There we go. They're entering from quite a steep hill, it looks like. It's very cool to be with a big, big, large herd. You can see all sorts from the biggest, biggest males that have hardly any skin left and the old old bosses to the young calves that would only have been born very recently over the last few months from the November period all the way down to January March and you can hear the sound of ox peckers loads of them it's the red billed ox pecker is making a lot of noise and that's giving this large herd away quite easily but that sound and there are so many of them I can't believe how many we've seen there's, there's a buffalo in the distance there that has probably well he's just walking on a frame there he has huge horns we'll see him come back there is a lot of them here I'll tell you that and with these large herds, I often find that there will be some predators following them. I've counted over 150, 150, 200 buffalo. I haven't actually counted that. <laughs> Rather, I've just been observing the amount of them as they walk and graze through the land here. Now also, they, what they eat is, they do browse, like a, you'll see some browsing, like the one that you're seeing now. 5% of their eating is browsing, so that was quite cool to actually see that. Mainly we just see buffaloes grazing the grasses and not the leaves of trees. Actually you see that a buffalo over here is trying to get that nice lush thick grass up on a termite mound. It's trying to work its way around the termite mound. And it has a look at us with all the grass in its mouth. And it's back to grazing. But this herd is is just growing and growing in numbers. It's remarkable to see how many how many buffaloes are coming out this afternoon. So a country would like to know what the plural, plural word for buffaloes are. And I've always just called the, you know, the buffaloes the large herd. The large herd. I'm not sure what the collective noun is for the buffaloes. Have a look at the amount of them. It is very cool to be watching this. So what could have actually happened? Because I don't even know what's on that side. We can't tra traverse where they are now. And they're walking up the hill there. So there might very well be a watering hole there where they all went and drank. So let's see if there's any evidence. Let's go close to, to the bottom of their legs. Maybe that will give us some sort of indication to whether they were in some thick mud or some water because they're coming back into our property. So 
there are loads of buffalo just walking around here. And those buffaloes are incredible. That looks like it's the last few of them heading into our property. So let's, let's get a little bit closer and watch them move through. As I said, there's always a chance of seeing Debbie and Crystal are very aware, well, are asking what happened to that carcass. Well, Debbie and Crystal, we went looking everywhere for it and we went and found where it, the kill mark was and there was nothing left behind. As you can imagine, hyenas leave nothing behind and we saw all those vultures after that. So we definitely could tell that nothing had been left behind. So we went looking to see if there was anything else, but otherwise we were ready to go and find something else this afternoon. Like the big large herd that has just crossed into our property. So we are now going to move in a direction where we might find some leopard tracks and see if we can locate, locate on a beautiful spotted cat this afternoon. It was incredible to see that many buffaloes and it's so cool to know that they're coming into our property so we'll just make a loop where we'll go up and look for tracks and by looking for tracks for a leopard we can search it but we also know that there's a big herd of buffalo that is heading into our property so we can move and see if there might be another predator lurking around that this evening when the lions the leopards and all the predators wake to go and find their food for the evening had the most incredible, just an incredible afternoon yesterday. Jamie found and saw ostrich, wildebeest, and cheetahs hunting. And Dave was there as well. So Dave, Dave's had the most remarkable time in Cheetah Plains. We've been to Cheetah Plains. I, I can definitely tell you I'm starting to fall in love with that land. It just brings such a diversity, a different diversity of animals into the safari. To experience a jackal is just, you know, it's just very, very cool. And I hope that I can bring that experience to many of the viewers when I get to go back there <laughs> when I'm on Rusty. Because Rusty is the only car that can take us there. So when I'm in, this is actually Jigger we're in now. We're in Jigger now. So we're testing Jigger out because Jigger's been, been in, almost been looked after, seeing if we could fix her. But she's doing well. Tony would like to know how Elvis is doing today. There he is. Tony is doing well. He's got a new tusk, as you can see. Very cool tusk. And he is going to be helping us search for anything that we might like to see this afternoon, whether it be lions, leopard, hyenas, anything. How cool is that bush baby we saw last night? That was very cool to see a bush baby. Now, last night was full of, full of action. Too much action last night. It's always good. It's exciting. I was just listening in my earpiece to all those things that were happening and I was just going crazy. I was so excited. So there doesn't seem to be any tracks and this is where we, we often find Kojima's tracks. I like to drive this this area because it's Kojima likes to walk this line in Saint Park. So there's always a chance of finding something special here. So All right, so myself, Elvis and Dave are going to go into this area and see what we can find. For the time being, James is on Cheetah Plains, potentially he's found himself something quite cool. Hello everybody, can you hear me Rhonda? You find me lying up here in a marula tree for a number of reasons. The first is that I saw the tree and I desperately wanted to climb it.
so that's what I did. The second is to demonstrate, we will often ask, are we likely to see a leopard in a tree? And the answer is only normally if they're running away from something or if they've hidden or stashed some food in one. And the reason for that is a tree, I was just experimenting myself, is not very comfortable. There are sticky arty bits that stick into all the soft parts of your body. Now, if you have the soft belly of a leopard, I imagine lying like this for any length of time is fairly uncomfortable. And while it starts off quite comfortably, eventually bits and pieces start to stick all over you. <coughs> right, it's enough of that. So this is a marula tree, as is obvious. Well, perhaps not obvious to all of you, but a marula tree, of course, is the sort of iconic tree of this area. And this one, I can see various parts up here where probably cats have climbed. There are bits and pieces of um, fur from where kills have been stashed over the years. And you can see that the tree is now starting to lose its leaves. These trees will remain incredibly important as forage for elephants, especially the bark, and also uh, for the leaves. But now, what is it? We, the, we had a discussion the other day about the possibility that only the male trees of the marula species are debarked by elephants, that perhaps there is some way that they know which ones are male and which ones are female, i.e. which ones produce fruit and which ones don't produce fruit. And it's my postulation that they are more likely to debark a male tree which does not produce them fruit than they are a female tree. And I think over the winter, let's watch, because I think over this dry season uh, we're going to see quite a few debarked marula trees and I'd be very interested to know which ones are male and which ones are female. This one, I can't really tell but for the fact that there's very little grass underneath and I can't see any I can't see any nuts but we'll be able to tell if it's a male or female by the number of nuts that there are underneath it. Now I'm going to attempt to get out of the tree now. This might be fairly embarrassing. It might be action filled. Um, it also uh, might be fairly dangerous. So Jean-Dre, I'm taking it that if I do fall down I will laugh. But you will uh, come and help me. Will you help me, jean -Dre? I'll consider it. Or do you think you'll probably just laugh? Laugh. This next bit is going to be very inelegant, everyone. Do I look like a baboon? That wasn't actually that inelegant at all. I'm quite impressed with myself. This, of course, is going to be the ultimate test of my skills and suppleness. From there I'm going to jump. Let us see if my aging, almost 40-year-old bones can take the plummeting mass. Here we go. Too late now. I'm of course going to pretend that didn't hurt at all. Stroll over and show you that this is a female tree because of the nut that was underneath it. And I'm going to ignore the powerful stabbing pains going up my lower legs from my heels all the way up into my lower skull. Female tree, not barked, debarked. So, that's my little story of the marula tree. I quite enjoyed climbing that tree, Jandre. Did you enjoy filming it? Quite. Jandre has been begging me to pretend to be a leopard in a marula tree for some time. Now his fantasies have been realized. On we go. Where? Yeah. Oh, I don't want to touch it. Here, you can put that in front of there you are. There's a stink bug, everybody. Chandra has very bravely put it on his hand. He is now going to smell horrible for the rest of the drive. <laughs> they do smell disgusting. <laughs> Debbie, you thought I was much more prey than predator there. You thought I was an impala with a leopard yanking on my leg. Uh, thankfully, I wasn't. 
I wouldn't like to be dragged up into a tree by a leopard. I think that would be an unpleasant experience. <laughs> it's got all blustery. It was rather pleasant genre of aerials. Uh, Bella? Um, Bella, you say how the question is how did James get up into the tree? And apparently Geraldine has very kindly provided you with a slow-mo replay of how I got up into the tree. So have a look at this. And that's how I got into the tree. Thank you, Jean Drain. Yes. <laughs> we went past three in a row pan where there is no water, as there is no water in the Juma Dam. I'm sure they will start to pump three in a row pan fairly soon as the dry season progresses. And I was hoping to find quarantine lurking in his favorite marula tree there but unfortunately he was not. We've seen some hyena tracks, we've seen uh, one terrapin while you were offline, so sorry about that, but other than that I'm afraid it's been fairly quiet. I'm not surprised given this blustery weather that has blown in from the southeast. Apparently a chance of rain, which is quite nice. Uh, I think it's more wishful fantasy thinking than it is an actual reality, but maybe we'll get a few spits of rain. It's incredible over the last week how the colour of the vegetation has changed completely from that sort of summer green to this really sort of greyish, greyish drought. It'll go the golden colours of winter, but the grasses have already changed to that sort of colour they were before the first rains that we had. We'll pop out into the clearings now. And with any luck, there will be a great spray of different kinds of animals. Here we go. Are you ready, Jean-Dre? You're not going to know where to point that camera. Oh! I feel like I'm in Cape Town. The wind is blowing so hard from the southeast. Sam would feel right at home over here. Not much going on in the clearings here, everybody. There is some water. Let's just, uh, we must kind of play East African tracker in this area because it is clearing. So we've got to scan the clearings. This is what they do in East Africa with those vast plains because you can miss an ear sticking out of the grass or a cheetah lying on a termite mound, perhaps an ostrich with its head buried in the sand. That last one is not true. Ostriches don't, in fact, bury their heads in the sand. Nobody really knows where that legend comes from. Except that they do dig about and they do sometimes swallow stones, as all birds do, but obviously an ostrich swallows proportionately larger stones. jean I see no surreptitious ears sticking out from any tuft indicating that this clearing is as lifeless as it appeared on our arrival. Let us continue through it to the other side. Just checking the tracks on the road here. Signs of cheetah. Cheetah, of course, will go into... Cheetah will go into clearings and there's a leopard track here. It's not a very fresh leopard track, but it is a leopard track. And so, just for the sake of it, we'll go down here rather than that way. I don't think we'll, I mean, if we do find this leopard, it will be completely bumping it.
Now, there'd be a very good question from you about whether, if we have rain or not, whether the season is too late for there to be growth. Um, and Debbie, the answer is probably yes. There will be a flush of green. There's no question the grass will flush because it doesn't get cold enough here for it to go completely dormant. And even if you get rain in the very late winter, uh, you will get a small flush. But um, it, won't, it won't result in a great swathe of growth, no. So the grass will stop growing because there's no water. And water is the limiting factor. It's not so much the temperature. Oh, you have got the super zoom camera there, don't you? Yes, you do, Andre. I'm going to befall on you to film this spider's nest here. There it is, over there. Yes, I'm going to go over to it, Jandre. Jandre likes to be kept abreast of what I'm going to do, otherwise he gets very unsettled. You see it? Now this originally looked like the nest of the tropical tent web spider. Can you hear me all right? Tropical tent web spider. I don't think that's what it is though, because it doesn't have that very sort of obvious trapeze net underneath it, but it does in the middle have an egg sac. So whatever spider has made this, little spiderlings are going to come out of there sometime soon emerge onto this sort of very fine mesh of secure security I suppose it is for the spiderlings and I suspect they will eat whatever gets caught in this sticky mesh over here. I don't know what kind of spider it is though but it is quite it's quite impressive. Ooh. Ooh. Chandra, I'm going to give you something very small but very delicious. Say thank you. There we go. It is called the bird's brandy, I think, or Lantana Rigosa. Here you are. It's a really delicious little blueberry look. Did you drop them? No, you can't have any more. I've only got two left. I'm going to eat them. You'll just have to suffer. There they are. Quite difficult to see. Can you see them? And they are, it's Lantana Rugosa, like I say. And they're delicious tasting little berries. Should I give jean one? one? Think I should? Mm. They really are very nice. I've got another one. Thank you, those ones aren't the best examples of them, but they are actually very sweet, very nice. Um, taste like tiny little sweet grapes. And there's a species of lantana that grows here that is not indigenous. But this one, which grows sort of very intermittently around the place, I've seen very few since I've been here, is really nice. I think that's what it was, John. It might not have been. We may have just poisoned ourselves. So if any of you are younger viewers, in fact even if you're older viewers, don't go out into the wilderness and be eating anything unless you know exactly what it is. You can get yourself into nasty trouble doing that. Tony, yes, absolutely. You say is the golden orbweb spider that we have, or the golden spider that you called it, but it's the golden orbweb spider. You say, is it the one that makes the strongest known substance, um, natural fiber in the world? Yes, it is. So, pound for pound, or I mean, strength-wise, it is stronger than steel of the same thickness. So those golden orbweb spiders, which usually at this time of the year would be absolutely everywhere because of uh, the summer rains, which didn't come this year, that is 
the stronger, one of the strongest known substances, and it is stronger than high tensile steel of the same thickness. Thank you for that, Tony. Let's head across to Sam, find out what he's doing. We're about to emerge onto the next planes. So we have just bumped into a nice breeding herd of elephants, a nice family group of youngsters, a big mother that's just around the corner there, and a sweet, sweet little young one. So we're just going to sit with these elephants as we watch them gra or graze and browse on the, on the trees around here. So the wind and the weather is very, very, very different to what it was yesterday. As James was saying, I feel a little bit like I'm at home with the wind, as Cape Town is quite a windy place. Um, there's strong winds, so as we know, I know that you guys were with us when we saw those water bucks acting very, very strangely. It's no different this afternoon. The wind is just a little, maybe a little bit stronger than that day, so all the animals are going to be paying more attention to the wildlife around it and the sound of a predator moving through because they can't hear as well as the wind blows. So it always makes all the animals a little bit more nervous and we've had such a good afternoon already. We've seen a huge herd of buffalo and now a breeding herd of elephants as we went on our tracking. So we, we thought we found some tracks a little bit earlier, but we didn't manage to find the tracks of the leopard. But we're going to head in that direction in a few minutes. Let's just sit here with these elephants for about two more minutes, three more minutes, and see if we can see a little bit what they're feeding on, what they're enjoying to eat here. There's, there's the young one on the very right hand side there. So you can even notice in the in the background that there is some clouds. Here we go, some thick clouds. And inside this drainage, coming down into a drainage line are all these elephants. And so they're going into these these areas, probably, <gasps> James is with a jackal, go to James. Just a quick one here, jean is very upset that we're linking to this, he doesn't, it, for his very uh, sort of sophisticated filmic mind, he doesn't think this is a nice shot, because it is at some distance, that is a blackback jackal everybody, and it is a long, long way from where we are. We did the East Africa spotting thing, and we found it there on Mala Mala. It is a Mala Mala jackal. Now, I don't know where its partner is. It'll be somewhere around there, but that's one of the pair of blackback jackals that lives in these clearings. And totally invisible with a naked eye, actually. You would never see that with a naked eye. Look at that. That's basically what we can see with a naked eye. I have these spectacular binoculars, so that's what we saw there. And we're going to continue just quickly doing a scan through here. So let's go back to Sam and if we find anything else in the clearings here, we shall be sure to let you know. So you just saw a jackal with James. How exciting, two jackals in two days. One with Jamie, one with James. All I can say is I hope that I can bring you one maybe tomorrow. I'm as excited to see a jackal as I think most of the viewers. I still haven't seen one since I've been here. What was even more exciting about yes, as you saw a blackback jackal. So good sighting, James. But we are sitting with a female elephant. We can also notice that she's got two different tusks there, two different sized tusks, which is quite interesting. So as we so as we explained yesterday, elephants can have different sized tusks, and that's why it's no different to our friend here, Elvis. There's Elvis with a tusk there, and a smaller tusk there. So, <laughs> I see some similarities. Maybe you are the, the 
real version of Elvis the Ellie, but Elvis is a man, and that is quite clearly a lady over there. She is a beautiful elephant. She's, she's quite young, she's still a teenager. She's been acting quiet and just, oh, there, look at this. She's trying to show us how strong she is. Check how strong I am. Is she going to do it again? Is she going to wrap her trunk around? Oh, no, she's just going to get some grass. So she was, she was, oh, here we go. Here's another young, young one. So these young ones have been having quite an interesting behavior. Smelling us, flapping their ears. I love it when they do that. I think it's so cool. Let's watch the interaction between these two. It's very cool to see that. Look at how they've... That's so... And as we know, tomorrow is Mother's Day, everyone. And we know that the mother plays a strong role in our lives. And we know with elephants, they are matriarchal. And the mother elephant really, really is the wise leader. She will take the herd in a direction. Whenever there is, you know, they're going through droughts, she will take on the burden of directing the elephants in a direction where they can find water and resource to food. And so when we have Mother's Day tomorrow, we'll talk more about this in the Sunset Safari. I thought we should mention it now while we watch those two elephants. I watch those elephants just connecting over there. It was very cool to see that. It looked like a really nice interaction. And so tomorrow evening we will sit around a fire and talk around the relevant issues, well not issues, the relevance of mothers in our lives and what the mothers are like out here in the bush, from the hyena to the elephant. Mother's Day is a very important day. Very, very important day. So I'm just going to move a little bit forward so we can get a last little view of these enemies. You can see a bird that's in that tree. The go-away bird looks very cool with those clouds in the background. There you go. Great camera work by Dave. Getting a shot of that tree with the elephant and the bird. And look, she's still very interested in us. Most of the herd has moved down into the thicket now and she's still remaining eating. She's just moved off now. <laughs> so now she wants to be behind a bush. That's okay. I'm behind a bush. So these elephants, there's a the youngster. We can say goodbye to the youngster. There he goes. Go to your mom. There he goes, off to his mom. So I always love, love to think about how elephants are with their mothers. And, you know, they learn so much. An elephant learns so much from their mother, whether it's from feeding to, to drinking to using their trunks. They're like, I don't know if that feeling would you had when you were at school when there was something like someone you would aspire to and you would like to follow them. You know, for an elephant, you often see that the way in which the young, the young Ellies are. How they follow the mother and they learn all the lessons, especially the young females, because the females you know, the ones closest in relation to the matriarch will then take over the herd. So, we saw this morning, well, I didn't see it, uh, I think it was Jamie that saw it, or James, the wildebeest that was getting eaten by the hyenas. Let's link to James, who's with the wildebeest.
Yes, these ones are not being eaten by hyenas, everybody. They are standing in the clearing, looking a little bit miserable as the wind blows in from the southeast and renders them feeling like Cape Tonians. Jandre, do you feel like one of these wildebeest? Do you feel at home here with this howling southeaster rolling in? Rather. Mm. And they're in the clearing, of course, because it is windy and so they can see what wants to bite them. Now, there were reports of two cheetah around here this morning. We've just been past Mike of Cheetah Plains, and he says that there were two cheetah coming across here from Malamala to the north during the course of the morning. He didn't have any further information on that, so we're going to just patrol the clearings as we have been and see if we can't find one of them. That would be marvellous. A nice herd of wildebeestes, and they'll all be pregnant now, all the females and they'll go into the dry season, of course, carrying those energetically very expensive fetuses. And so I think you will find that the birthing season, the lambing and calving seasons, come the end of the dry season, are probably going to be slightly less impressive than they were this last year, because the water table is going to be that much lower. There's a little bit of bird activity up in front of us, which is quite interesting. We've got two magpie shrikes chasing chasing the virtual starling around. And Patty, you're in Tennessee and you're wondering if the cooler weather will result in some of the lazier animals like the cats uh, being more active. Kathy, I think you'll find maybe a little bit, but I think I think they'll still continue to sleep probably for their 20 hours of the day. A lion does not like to give up on his sleep. And so I think you'll find that uh, it, while they may be a little bit more active during the course of their, a cool day like this, the leopards possibly more so, and maybe the cheetah, instead of hunting crepuscularly, in other words at dawn and dusk, would be more prepared to hunt at this time of the day. So yeah, I think it will make a change. But you know, a lion doesn't sleep because it's hot. A lion sleeps because they need to sleep. Uh, they have to have that sleep in the same way that your house cat does or your house dog has to sleep for the length of time that it does. Their digestive systems and energy balance and nutrient uptake is such that they find it difficult to produce a huge amount of kind of short-term energy bursts. No carbohydrate in their diet at all. They must generate their energy from protein, which is expensive, or fat, which is, there isn't much in the food that they eat. So a little bit forward here. So there seems to be some hornbill action, high action genre, high action hornbills. There are two red billed hornbills hopping about, biting each other or biting something. It was those three there, Jean-Henri, on the fr in front of us, on the left. That's it. That's them. They were having a bit of a fight, a bit of argy bargy. It's a good word, that, don't you think, Jean-Henri? Mm. Argy bargy. It's a very modern word, of course. But now they're just knocking about the place, finding little insects. Oh, the super zoom's too wonderful. You can see the way they move. When you, when you watch them hop like this, see how they land first on the right foot and then the left foot? And what you find is that they, their feet land almost in front of each other, so it looks like they're standing sort of wide-hipped, but they're not. And when you see their tracks on the road, the first time I saw a hornbill track, I had no idea what it was, until I saw a hornbill running along the road. And then I came to look at the track, and they, it's, it's bizarre. The feet land almost completely in front of each other, and it leaves a sort of irregular stripe. And you can see why. They hop about like that, the one leg landing before the other, and the other landing in front. That guy looks like he's got a peg leg, but I don't think he does. Right, I'm going to reverse now. And we're going to go up into these clearings here behind us. Very nice, Jondo. I'm sorry we don't have some butterflies for you to film with this camera. Jondo doesn't like filming butterflies with the other camera. He complains bitterly. It becomes very irksome.
The other exciting thing about this camera is that it is now, we've discovered, got, John, I'll let you make the announcement. What has it got? A battery. No, not a battery. Try again. A microphone. No, one more. A lens. Yes. It's also got infrared, so we're going to be trying some infrared stuff this evening, which will be quite interesting. Critting. So let's do one more scan of these clearings. See, a cheetah wouldn't be lying quite, I don't think, in the open in the same way that that jackal would be. They would be lying in the fringes, just kind of waiting in the fringes to explode out and chase something across the plains. There are some impala there. They don't look particularly startled by life. It's always better when an impala looks startled if you're looking for cheetahs. That one looks chilled to the max, Jean-Ray. Totes. Totes chilled. Boo. So I'm just scanning the fringing vegetation with me binoculars. I see nothing but waving bushes in the driving wind. It's not that driving everyone, I'm exaggerating. But it is quite stiff. A stiff breeze. I see no cheetahs. On we go, Jandri. Jandri, remember that uh, thing that we had where you click as the camera comes back on to me? That is so as to avoid my looking like a total imbecile on screen. <laughs> oh, Leopold, what a, <laughs> what a great question. You say, do the herds of wildebeest here ever get as large as the ones from the Lion King? Yes, they do, but not here. Uh, they get that big in East Africa, around the Serengeti and the Masai Mara. There they get up to two million in that great migration. Two million wildebeest move across those plains. So yes, they do. Not here. Here the habitat is not ideal. Uh, it's perfectly ideal for this subspecies of the wildebeest. This is called the blue gnu. The one in East Africa that you saw migrating in the Lion King, the one that ran over the hapless Mufasa as he plummeted from the cliff edge of the possibly the Great Rift Valley. Um, they are something called the brindled gnu, and while they are the same species as that, they have got a kind of, um, they've got a white beard as opposed to a black beard. I'm just going to find out if that's not my calling us. I can't hear nothing. Mike, come in. Mike, any luck your side? Mike's gone that way. Very fresh, um, swing, going off, and I'm in a central road. Heading towards, uh, three in a row. I'm just, uh, following up, um, following the road. Yeah, he says there's some leopard tracks on one of the roads we managed to miss today. Okay, copy, thanks. Keep me posted. I'll come give you a hand there just now. Right. We'll see if he has some luck. He's quite far from where we are now. Oh. Quickly, Jandri. It's Swainson's Franklin, everybody. And I know that their colour of their faces is red, of course. And Samuel has something else red to show you. That is a dreadful link. Dreadful, dreadful, dreadful. From the fantastic Swainson Franklin to this sunset. So it's not quite red like the face of the Swainson. But it's got quite a nice yellow to it and you can quite clearly see the weather conditions that is going down here in the Sabi Sands. So it might just be raining in the distance there. I can't tell if that is rain or if it's just the shine of the sun through the clouds there. But isn't that beautiful? We saw the Swainson Franklin the other day. That was a new bird to our bird list, which was fun and exciting. But you can hear 
I think I've heard the sound of impala rutting the whole day today. But in the distance, we can kind of hear that. Let's see if we can find one for you so, so we can show you what they act like when they're in this season. But as we get going, I just want to show you my next little bit of drawing that I did. It's a steenbok. So that's a little picture of a steenbok that I did. And I would like to see if we can find a steenbok today so we can learn a little bit more about its behavior and I can write some things down on our page here. So steenbok, otherwise known as the stonebuck, difficult to find out here in the bush. But I decided let's draw it. And if we see it, we can learn a little something about it. So we can learn together what is this stoneback. I just saw an impala in the distance there. It's a bit far though. I'll see if I can get a good view on it. So the peak of their rutting season is during the new, the new moon in May. And it was new moon last night. So that is probably why we can hear these guys growling a lot. And I'll tell you what, the predators are quite excited because at this time of year those impala rams aren't thinking too much about the safety of themselves but of the dominance of their within their bachelor groups and trying to get the females together that they lose consciousness around being safe out here there's a hyena in front of us why is there a hyena two hyenas in front of us this is very exciting What are they doing? This could very well be the hyenas that we saw a little bit earlier. They're running up the road here. Just the one. I'm not going to go too close. I'm just going to go slowly behind them. The ones on the left here that's running left. We don't know where they might take it. I'm going to follow the one on the road, of course. Please don't go off road. The other one just went off road. This is so cool. How exciting when things like this happen out here in the bush. You just cannot expect so where they might be leading us, I don't know. They've gone into the thick bush. We can't follow them in the thick bush. The best thing that we can do is get into a position where we might be able to see them again. Maybe they'll enter the road that we have here. Maybe they've smelt something. Can't see them right now. But I'm going to go into the next clearing to see if they pop out. So how's that? Eh? You could just be enjoying the sunsets and looking what's in the distance. And next thing, a hyena jumps into your frame. My cap's going to blow off because it's too windy out here. Okay, hold on to your caps and your seats. We're going to see if we can relocate on those hyenas. It's not, it's not going to be easy though. I just realized the next road is only here. So this is the next open area that we have. So we're just going to sit here for the next two minutes. Let's go and look at the bird James has got while we try to look for these hyenas. Look everybody, we don't get pictures of the lilac breasted roller like this Ooh, very often. He's coming closer even. He's landed on the ground, he's caught something. He's flying away. Well done, jean -Dre. jean -Dre is performing some acrobatics in the back there. Oh, well done. Marvellous. <laughs> so, uh, there's another interesting bird here, and I'm, I'm sure many of you who are experienced birders and have kept your bird lists for a long time will have him. On the ground here, jean -Dre, there's a large flock of Senegal lapwings. And they're not that unusual for this area, but they're not that common either. And they seem to come and go a bit nomadically. So where you can almost guarantee that there will be a pair of crowned lapwings in just about every clearing, these Senegal lapwings are much more sparse and seem to be a bit more nomadic in their ways. Yeah, lovely call. <laughs> no treaty yet. Obviously. I don't think we would have been looking at the Senegal lapwings if we'd had a cheetah. Not to diss the Senegal lapwing, of course. It's not its fault. It wasn't uh, 
Who knows, not quite as much in demand. Ah, Joyce, you're in New Hampshire and you say, is there another word for a magpie? You mean the magpie shrike? Uh, Joyce, yes, there is. It's called a long-tailed shrike. Um, I don't know when, how old your book is, but if it's sort of a pre... what, a pre-2000 book, um, then it will certainly be a long-tailed shrike, but it's also under the shrikes. So if you're looking in the content section of the book, it'll be under the shrikes. A magpie shrike. You want to do the impala, do you? All right, shall we? There's an impala, everybody. It's <laughs> running away. Oh, lovely shot, John. Look at its legs. Why don't you super zoom its fetlock gland? <laughs> Brilliant stuff. <laughs> John just pulled a rude sign at me, everyone. Jesse, a nice question about sexual dimorphism. I'm just not sure. Are you talking about birds or mammals, Jer Jerry? Antelope. Right, so why in some antelope species, you say, Jesse, are, is there the sexual dimorphism where the males and females don't look the same? And why in other... Oh, look, 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 look these, these two woodpeckers chasing each other through the bushes here on the left. I think they're, they're Bennett's woodpeckers, everyone. It's possibly the most unusual woodpecker that we get. No, they're not. They're bearded, but they're still nice. Just quickly look there. Well, the super zoom is fantastic. You see the way the tail acts as a sort of... Um, I can never remember the word I want to use for this. As a brace. There we go. It acts as a brace. It's much more firm than on any other bird, and it allows them to brace against the tree while they're bashing their heads against it. That's a wonderful shot that we had there. You saw there that the golden tail of the woodpecker was kind of splayed out and was bracing against the wood of the tree, and that allows them to get very firm purchase when they're pecking away at the wood. Uh, Jesse, sexual dimorphism in antelope, why are some sexually dimorphic and why are others not sexually dimorphic? Uh, well, they are, they are all to a certain extent. I'm kind of guessing that you're asking about why the ones, some have horns and some don't, some females have horns and some don't, maybe. I guess the most obviously sexually dimorphic antelope is a Nyala. And the most obviously unsexually dimorphic antelope that we get here would be a wildebeest. So in the Nyala, the male is charcoal coloured, rich charcoal, and he's got horns, and he's got a long shaggy coat. The female is a sort of rich russet red colour, and she does not have horns, and she's smaller. So, uh, I mean, their, their sexual dimorphism, I think, has got quite a lot to do with sort of a peacock's tail, if you like. So the color difference has been selected for over the generations so that a male of certain male characteristics is possibly more attractive than uh, another kind of male. In terms of the horns though, what you find is that or in terms of the size difference in the horns, that's a function of testosterone where the males will get bigger and they will always be larger because of that, that, um, that hormone. What are you shaking your head at? Anyway, I don't know what is wrong with my camera at the moment. Um, so, so it's very distracting indeed. I'm going to have a word with him through the medium of a clenched fist when we next go offline. Um, so Jesse, that's why they are. I'm kind of, I mean, they're all sexually dimorphic, but if we go to a wildebeest where the female's got horns and she's obviously slightly more uh, closely sized than the male is, I think that's got to do with the fact that she does a lot more defending uh, with her size against predators. So what you find is that where the females are big and they have horns, they use, uh, they will often turn and face what their, their potential predators, whereas animals that don't have horns, the females are, that find themselves without horns 
uh, will normally use hiding and running away as a defense. So, where the males only have horns, you find that the horns are there largely for them to fight with each other. And where the males and females have horns, you find that there is a defensive uh, function against predators. I, I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't quite, please send through another one and I will attempt to do better. Right here, we're now on the Kruger boundary, everybody. Very exciting. Off to the eastern side here is Kruger. Hmm. Betty, you're in Texas and you want to know why on earth would a woodpecker choose to bash its head against a tree? Why do they peck on trees? Are they looking for tree worms? Yes, they are, Betty. They're looking for food in the trees. They dig holes and, I mean, one of the big things, or one of the main eaters of dry wood is would be wood boring beetles which will lay their eggs inside the wood and they will hatch into larvae or caterpillars or not caterpillars but uh, basically grubs if you like they're the larvae of beetles and it's exactly what those woodpeckers are going for they'll drill out the grubs the other reason they do it of course is to open up holes for them to nest in so they will find a fairly rotten piece of wood and drill it out and make a nice nest inside it but you saw how that tail was so superbly designed for them to brace against the wood. Oh, now Lucy in Indiana, you want to know how many different kinds of woodpeckers we get here. Lucy, we get four different kinds. I'm just going to get my book out. Unfortunately, this irksome cameraman has covered my box of things with his jacket because he doesn't like the color of my box, you see. Well, it was close. I nearly lost my phone there. Um, <laughs> I'm going to leave this chap in the Kruger Park and film myself on the way home. <laughs> there you are. Okay, it's fine now. Um, the woodpeckers, very conveniently in this particular book, are all on one page that we get here. There are four of them, and they include the cardinal woodpecker, which is the little one, so named for his red hat. They've all got a red hat, but he's the one that gets the name of the Catholic bishop, the cardinal. Then we have the golden-tailed woodpecker there. And I know that, I'll tell you why I know those others were bearded woodpeckers now. Then we have the bennets down them here, and they're obvious by the fact that they feed on the ground. And then we have the bearded, and the bearded is the big one. And I noticed that very clear black stripe there under the eye to go with the red top to the head and that's how I knew that was a bearded woodpecker. And they've all got golden tails, so one's called a golden tailed woodpecker, at least that's called golden tailed. They've all got a golden tail. They've all got the red cardinal's cap on them, either the male or the female. It just depends on which one is given the name. So those are the four, very conveniently on one page. Righty, on we go. Ooh. is that? What we have here, everybody, is an interesting track, Chandri. I'm just going to move to the side of the road here. Can you see the track there? Is it? I'll, I'll, it's in front as well. I'll, I'll get it in front. How's this one here? Is this alright? Can you see one, two, three, four? And again, one, two, three, four. What do you think that is, everyone? It's quite interesting. It's an enormous bird. And I was just talking about its much smaller cousin earlier on, the red-billed version. And remember I said that they walk with their legs in front of each other, a bit like a ramp model might. You get my meaning? <laughs> This is a, uh, it's a ground hornbill that's been walking along here with these enormous tracks. So, I mean, the track's that big, um, six inches, six inches long. And that's the ground hornbill, the big turkey-like bird, which we see often in this area in a flock. Maybe he's along here. This road's also been recently dragged. And by dragged, I mean somebody's graded it. So that's really quite nice. I don't, I'm not sure that I've ever seen them so clear like that before. Do you like my...
Right, let's go across to Sam. He's uh, not found the hyenas he was looking for, but he has found a forlorn looking cousin of what they ate last night. So we went looking for the hyenas as they went into the thicket, so they could very well be in the thicket to the west of us at the moment. But we just came across this wildebeest, and you don't often see wildebeest here on our property, purely because it's quite thick in vegetation. You'll normally find them where you are with James on Cheetah Plains, in those big, large groups that they have there on the big open areas. So it's nice to see this, and this is a big male wildebeest, and I thought we would show you quickly because that's exactly what was eaten last night by the hyenas. So we've just been tracking hyenas through the bush and we just came across that hyena. So it's good to kind of know the size of what that hyena was to the wildebeest that they ate last night, which is obviously not that one that they ate because that one's very much alive and well. But what we're doing is those hyenas went into the thicket down there. We don't know where they were going. They look like they could have been going back to their den site, which is further further to the north of us. So potentially we may go back to the den site a little bit later to see what the hyena den is doing. For the time being, we're going to just move in this area and see what activity is going out. Because most of the time when you have hyenas running around during the daytime is when something special is going on. Maybe a kill, maybe something's happened. So we just want to drive the area and make sure nothing's happening here or make sure something is happening here yeah, so we can bring you some some action out here but the wind is super strong I have to put my cap backwards otherwise it's going to blow off we're going to hopefully see if we can spot those two hyenas running through the thicket so we're just doing one big loop to see if we can find them it's so exciting how action can just happen in a few seconds We've also found tracks of a male elephant. So a big elephant bull that is a must is also walking in this, in this direction. So we might just come across another big elephant, similar to the one we had yesterday afternoon. Good afternoon, Jesse, and welcome to our afternoon safari. I'm glad you're here with us. You would like to see a saddle world stalk. Jesse, I'm, I love the saddle world stalk. If I get to see the saddle world stalk, I'll be very happy. So we're actually going to go towards Treehouse Dam, which is not far from here, to see if we can find anything that might be happening there. And that's a wolverine area. So the saddle world stalk very much likes that area. So we'll see if we can find a saddle world stalk for you, Jesse. Jesse, I would love to know where you're from and how old you are. It always makes it so much nicer for us to get to know our viewers a bit more. So let us know where you're from, how old you are, and what do you love? I'd love to know that. And is the Saddlebald Stork one of your favorite birds? Because if it is, I'm going to do my very best to see if we can find one. Good afternoon, Laura. You would like to know, do we have the Roadrunner bird? Ja uh, Dave, do you know what the Roadrunner bird is? I don't actually know what the Roadrunner bird is. Is that, um, was that the Roadrunner, it's similar to what, like a secretary bird, I think. I don't, I don't really know what the Roadrunner bird is. Is that from that cartoon, the Roadrunner? So I'm a little bit confused. I did enjoy that cartoon. Some beautiful looking kudu. Wow, look at that. How cool is that, everyone? We've got a female kudu on top of a termite mound. So this is quite interesting to see that. Not only can she get to the nice, nutritious, fertile grass that grows on top of termite mounds, She's also got a little bit of an advantage or vantage point where she's able to look around and hear and see a little bit more that might be going on around the bush because it is windy this afternoon. 
So she's definitely got herself in a good position to protect herself. She's not here on her own. There's another female that is in the bushes that you can't see right now. So we'll stay with this lady on top of the termite mound. And we were talking about termite mounds earlier. I think that was Matthew. Matthew, if you're still here, that's another great example of a termite mound. And that is a large kudu. So you can just think about how big that, that mound is. If I stood up and I'm 5.9 foot, that kudu probably gets up to my shoulder height. That is such a cool sighting. You can see those ears. The size of those ears are really, really big. And those ears, as you can see just behind that little bit of bush there, will be collecting all the different sounds that are going on out here. And that will give her the best form of protection. I'm just going to drive and see if we can get another cool view of her. I must say, I don't think I've ever seen a kuru on top of a termite mound like this before. She's definitely one king of the castle. I meant to say the queen of the castle, of course. She is the queen. Queen Kudu enjoying her grasses on top of the termite mound. And so they are browsers. You can see them quite clearly browsing on the trees. Very, very beautiful animals. Clayton is curious to know if the termites bite the animals or the humans. No, they do not bite. Not like the ants that can bite out here. There are a few ants that have the ability to give you a nice little bite. The termites out here don't bite. But what is really interesting is if you get close up to the termites, which I hope we can do, especially if it rains tonight, we might just get the chance of seeing a lot of termites coming out of the termite mounds. You'll see that there are... You know, there's a whole status, the whole hierarchy to the termites. It's soldier termites that come out and they protect the, the mound or protect the hole. And then you get the foragers that will go out and forage. So it's, it's really interesting when you start to learn about the social dynamics of not only a termite mound, but any kind of ant species or kudu, all organisms that are living out in this natural world of have a different way, a different purpose as the way in which they live. Very cool to sit with this kudu on top of the termite mound. So it's not quite the antelope that we were looking for this afternoon. It's actually very different. The steenbok is probably the smallest of the bucks and the kudu is the largest of the bucks out here, the antelope that are out here. And so we are looking for a steenbok. We did see a steenbok, I forgot to tell you that. We were driving, looking for the hyena, and next thing the steenbok jumps and flies away from us. So that was really cool. Just after talking about the steenbok, we saw one. Just for now, kudu on top of the mound. Stay protected up there, I'm sure you will do. We've had a, actually a very full afternoon of animals. Hyenas, huge group of buffaloes that are now, I think, towards... Juma Dam, if you, maybe if you go look on the Juma Dam cam, you'll see all those buffaloes moving. I don't know if you can get this. Dave, I'm just going to move in this position where you can look at that beautiful red. A beautiful sunset is occurring out here in the bush farm. So there is that red color that James is talking about with the Swenson Franklin. And so Safari Dean is... <laughs> Safari Dean, I must tell you... Okay, let me tell you what you're asking me first. You're asking, could you please do some animal noises for us? Um, all right. 
It's for the first year. I'm, I've got a very bad way of making noises. I think I'm quite monotonous or monotone. Um, maybe that's because I'm slightly deaf in this year. I don't know, but I'm just really bad at making good noises. But I can try to do the go away bird, which is. Goo -goo -goo. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't even know if I did that properly. Yeah, it sounds a little bit like that, eh, Dave? Did you, did you feel like that was a go away bird? So Dave says it could have been, so that's even more embarrassing. It could have been, it could have been the sound of giraffe, eh, basically, Dave? <laughs> go away, go away. That's what it sounds like as it moves into the bush fault. So we're going to head now towards Treehouse Dam. And the weather's getting a lot, lot, lot worse. The wind's blowing. My cap is managing to stick on my head, and you won't believe it, but uh, but uh, James Henry gave me a haircut today. <laughs> so that's what my hair's looking like. I don't know if you saw it the other day. It's very, very, very messy, and um, I just thought I'd, I needed. There's no hairdresser out here. There's no way I can go to cut my hair. I can't go ask the kudus to cut my hair. So I needed to ask someone in cap. To give me a little trim and I asked James Henry to give me a trim and um, I think he did a good job. I don't know, what do you guys think? So that's my hair done by James Henry. <laughs>